Hello and welcome to this lecture. This is the last lecture in a series on stream ecology for the summer of 2020 at St. Mary's College of Maryland. The last thing I wanted to cover in this course was restoration. Now this is not a how to do restoration in streams, but this is instead maybe a way to think about policy that has guided stream restoration and also uh, to think about why we might actually go about doing restoration in streams. One thing that often comes up when we mention the word restoration is the need to do it, right? Do we need to actually do this? And if we do need to do this, how would we potentially go about doing it? So why might we think about those as uh, important processes that we need to follow? And I want to be clear that in this lecture, just because I'm showing you a system that's clearly degraded from its initial state, for instance, this here is a fish advisory, do not eat any fish, I'm not necessarily recommending that restoration take place. It may not be worthwhile spending money on this stream, for instance. Is it helpful to spend lots of money on a stream that one of the major functions of which let's say it's the removal of fish, it's going to be probably impossible in any uh, realistic time horizon, right? When that money could be spent on restoring or protecting lots of habitat that is far less degraded. So those kind of trade-offs also need to be thought about. Degradation of a system is not something unique we find in one place. Degradation has been broad and one of the major organizations that is in charge of taking care of the waters in the U.S. is this, the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency. And they have been tasked with the protection of navigable waterways. And we'll talk a little bit about why uh, they have that power. First, I wanted to link to this video. Now, this is a long video about salmon restoration on the West Coast, and I know that it's not immediately related to Maryland, but it is useful in thinking about these large systems that can develop to provide restoration. And the uh, issues that surround that uh, are also very, very important to consider. So if you have time, I would recommend watching it. It's an interesting little thing, but if you don't have time, let me summarize it quickly. Salmon restoration, which is effectively stream restoration in the states because they do the work inside of the waters that are within their bounds, is hugely expensive, enormous quantities of money, uh, and people work at this. And what we can see from the work that we have done is, while we can provide huge amounts of technical solutions, and we can maybe allow uh, individuals to persist at very low levels, we're not able to get restoration in the way that we had originally planned. And so at this point, uh, we are struggling in many cases to keep sort of a, groups of animals hanging on by their fingernails. And this causes a, a large issue that it causes distrust and uh, dissatisfaction with the programs because they don't ultimately reach the goals that they had initially set. On the other hand, it does allow those uh, populations to persist, right? And if that's the goal to maintain these populations at some level, then it is possible to imagine uh, that they are being successful at some, some particular point. Now, there are a number of critical environmental laws, the reason that salmon are so well addressed at the state level, and I should have been more fair, it's not just that states do work inside their streams, they also do work within their navigable oceanways, and of course the federal government is involved outside of that area. But there's a number of environmental laws that have been put into place. Uh, I don't list them all here, but these are some big ones. So if you're interested in environmental law, then I would consider take, starting to look at some of these, indivi these individual um, actions. One of the really big sets of laws that were passed were in the 1970s, as you can see, and that was from about 1970 to just towards the end of the 70s there. But a couple really, really big laws, in fact, a couple that we've already mentioned, the Clean Air Act, and the Clean Water Act were two critical acts um, that basically give the EPA its power to uh, uh, regulate air and water. The Endangered Species Act, which allows uh, the federal government to step in when a species is potentially going to be driven towards extinction. There's also the Safe Drinking Water Act, again, an expansion of something about the Clean Water Act, right? It, it, it increases the power of the EPA. There's some of these about resource conservation, national forest man management, Magnuson-Stevens fishery conservation. So that occurred in the 1970s, and that's one of the major drivers of the conservation of salmon, but also the Endangered Species Act and the Clean Water Act play their roles. 
there's surface mining, and there's also um, some other additional uh, acts that have played. But I want you to see that the time period of these is very focused in the 70s, and that's not coincidental. That was directly in response to those public outrage and outcry that occurred in the 60s. But I also want to stress that they did not all occur in one year, right? These took many years to develop. They did not occur in the decade where the public outcry in some ways was building, right? That being the 60s. They occurred decades later, um, often 10 to 15 or more years later, because it takes that long for people who are of that kind of mindset to enter into the politics, to drive policy forward, to have people vote on it, to put that into law, to have that go to court and to have that be established as a national boundary that we're setting. So one of the reasons I bring this up now is because people often get discouraged when they look at our current political climate. And I want to remind you that indeed the political climate, I don't think anyone right now enjoys the current political climate and the political climate is therefore untenable, it won't possibly sit like this forever. But we need to be patient in that it's not going to change overnight and it takes time and many of the effects that occur, right, that we want to see changed in our in our national uh, policy take a long time to come about. So be thoughtful about that as you move forward. Um, it's I'm not discouraging political involvement. I think political involvement is very important for a democratic society. But I also want to stress that you should not expect change to occur overnight. It often takes time. And so you should expect to work at a marathon, not in a sprint. Now, all the laws in the United States, and this is a very heavily United States focused lecture because that's where we're located and that's where I have experience, come out of the power of the, of the Constitution. So these actually are built directly out of the Constitution and hence the reason they stand up in law, courts of law. But they come out of a very short sentence in the Constitution called the Commerce Clause, right? And this is really a sub portion of that. And it is the power that Congress has to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states and with Indian tribes. And what this means is that anything that crosses state boundaries, right, that any commerce or material that might be considered profitable or might cause damage or loss as it crosses state boundaries can be regulated by the federal government because no individual state can do anything about what comes into its borders, right? So it, ha it to, I should say, that's not entirely true. It has limited power to affect other states to do something outside their borders is a better way to say that. There is no place in the Constitution that provides a strict environmental protection, i.e. there is no place in the Constitution where the environment is recognized as important to human societies and flourishing and is therefore protected in and of its own right. The only reason the environment is considered now in the Constitution, in, I should say in the Constitution in quotes here, is because it has a direct impact on the market. And so the Constitution, it was written in a time where people did not think of nature separately from society. They, or I should say that it could be beneficial to society or that society needed nature. The way the group that the Constitution was written by perceived of nature as a competitor and a, and a danger to society and a danger to humans, and it had to be beaten and overcome. And that's very different than the world that we live in today, where you don't say to yourself, I need to go cut down this forest. It's a dangerous place. Right. But many of the people who were arriving in the uh, U.S. from Europe were of a mindset very similar to that. This forest must be controlled either by being removed or considerably modified because it is a literal danger to me. And you have to keep in mind that that is a very different world because those people have a very limited understanding of many of the mechanisms that we depend on to understand our world today. And so the best that they can do is try to modify the world uh, as they see a way to protect themselves. So when you see, say, large predatory animals, what's the solution to that? Remove forest, right? When you see diseases, what's the solution to that? Well, they believed it was from bad air, so drain swamps, right? These are ways in which you're trying to protect yourself. So again, don't demonize necessarily the people coming across. They were ignorant of the mechanisms we now understand. But that, I would argue, is through no fault of their own. They didn't have the amount of knowledge we have today. I will not excuse them for their really um, inappropriate and highly uh, amoral response to other humans, um, to the way in which they treated even people of their own uh, culture and creed. 
uh, and they there are numerous other uh, sort of sins that they brought with them. But I do want to make it clear that we need to be careful about just dumping them into all bad, all good, right? There is a bit of both in these, a bit of the angel and the demon at the same time. Now, one of the major pieces that's important to understand about the Commerce Clause then is there is a real strength in relying on the Constitution, i.e. it's this document we all ascribe to, but a real weakness when we don't specify something very explicitly as deserving of protection outside of its ability to be uh, brought into the market. So if the market cannot see a wetland, for instance, then that wetland cannot be protected and you cannot rely on the Constitution to do that. One of the things I want to point out is that the uh, ideas about the environment and it, it being a thing to protect took a long time to develop. Probably we're looking at really 100 to about 130 years in that ballpark. Uh, Thoreau's work on Walden, he would have certainly been part of the environmental movement if he had been born in the 60s. But his is some of the early work arguing for the importance of isolating and protecting wildness, not because it provides a market value, but because it deserves or needs to be protected for its own sake. You can see that there are other people in the 1860s, John Muir, who did a lot of walking around the Sierra Nevadas and then wrote a number of, of uh, books and founded a, a really important major environmental uh, organization, uh, also occurred in the late 1870s and into the early 1900s, but it takes a long time, right? Thoreau writes in the 1850s and the protection of wilderness uh, maybe doesn't occur until the early 1900s, and it's done with the explicit idea that it would be a useful area to protect so that it could be used for extraction, that we could hunt and fish in that region because it is good for people to do these things. So we should extract that resource from it. Okay, so, and when I say people here, I'm, I'm predominantly leaning on uh, white males, right? Because while it was protected broadly, uh, the real people who were gonna take advantage of that, and it was understood at the time, the real people who were gonna take advantage of that was white men. So be a little bit careful here too, when we think about protecting the environment, often it's a very narrow view, and it's only when a minority group comes up and says, hey, you said people, uh, and we that people forget that they didn't directly specify, I only wanted some of the people to be there. Uh, and it's important uh, to provide additional rights to the minority groups because they often get excluded. And this has been especially true in the environmental movement, which has been strongly, strongly driven uh, by white men and has not in many cases uh, been encompassing of other groups. And so its view of what to protect and what to restore has often been driven by that desire of what those people find important. And nothing wrong with necessarily what they find important, but this is a pretty diverse world and we need to be pretty thoughtful about what other people are important about. And then uh, another really important milestone by the 1950s, so 100 years after David Thoreau, Aldo Leopold uh, wrote the Sand County Almanac. This is a classic book. If you've done any environmental science reading, uh, you've probably read pieces of it. And uh, it's a good example, again, of that idea of we need to protect wilderness. Wilderness should be protected for wilderness's sake. And if you're interested in anything sort of reading about this, what I would do is take a look at some of these books. There's a number of very good ones. Take a look at when they're written, right? And then also take a look at what the author's meaning is uh, as you read them. These are sort of many classic books uh, read within environmental science and that have in many ways shaped uh, the theory and thought behind uh, large sections of the environmental science. And so it would be worth it if you have not read these, and especially because you're inside a lot now, to take a look at these and, and read at least a couple of them. Uh, if you could only pick one, I would probably do Sand County Almanac, uh, but there's a number of good ones. If you want to read a story about a, uh, a sort of recluse, um, cranky old man, Desert Solitaire is good. If you want to read more uh, focus on environmental pollutants, Silent Spring is excellent. If you're interested in the ecology of systems, uh, Never Cry Wolf is very, very good. Many of you have probably already read the Lorax. If you haven't, it's a very useful tool and it deals with restoration at the end. And John Muir, any of his writings, he wrote a number of different things. Uh, very interesting as he uh, moved around and through the Sierras. 
Now, there's in addition to things like acts and uh, groups that actually try to affect policy, there are these things called policies. And one of the major ones that we deal with in stream ecology is this thing called no, no net loss wetlands policy, which is effectively a goal set by an, someone in the federal government. And in this case, it was set uh, by George Bush, the C, oh, sorry, by Carter, I believe is the uh, original and then it expanded by Bush. Uh, and that what it says is that we do not want uh, federal policy to allow any more loss of wetlands. So you can't uh, continue to remove wetlands. And if you do remove wetlands, I'm only going to approve the project if you also make wetlands. So we can't have any more net loss of wetlands. And that's a policy. It's not an act, which means that let's say that an administration gets in place and they say we don't want to do this anymore. Well, they can eliminate it right now. That has not been the case. Uh, the Trump administration, for instance, has not eliminated the no net, land, no net loss, no net loss wetlands policy, but it has severely curtailed it. And there's not much uh, that, let's say, that the you can do. You can't uh, do much about that. You just have to accept it. It's a policy. It can be changed at any time. Now, if an act was passed saying no net loss of wetlands uh, act, right, then their hands would be tied unless they could repeal the act or modify it or potentially which is another approach that people have taken today because they're so uh the the ability to pass uh legislation has reduced so severely is you take it to court and try to chip away at its power until it becomes relatively useless okay and that's a very classic approach to what we're seeing with say the affordable care act you don't necessarily have the ability to get rid of it, but what you can do is strip it of the pieces that you think you can, right? So that you can actually get through your Congress. And then you take it to court and hammer on every little facet until you can try to chip it away. Whether that approach will be successful or not is not yet clear, uh, but I think we will have a decision on that next year. Now, no net loss on wetlands may not seem really important, but wetlands are areas, wetted areas near a lot of water bodies, not least of which are streams. And wetlands provide all sorts of benefits, right? They act as sponges, so when they change that lag time, they provide areas for organisms to breed, they provide uh, areas for organisms to uh, hide and, and be protected from human impacts. They create uh, recreational and tourism opportunities. Certainly we do research in them as well. They also uh, help degrade pollutants. But in fact, uh, one thing wetlands do, which actually increases pollutant issues is they make mercury, they, they bring mercury into the food web. So when mercury enters a wetland, it can be brought into the food web after uh, being digested by bacteria. So often we don't mention that, but wetlands actually do have that downside uh, associated with them. Anyway, wetlands occur in a lot of different areas, and so there are ben definite benefits to them, uh, and so protecting them makes sense. And um, there should be something that we consider in streams, because without wetlands, you're going to have this stream jumping around, right? It, and that that flashiness of the system will be quite large. So frequently, when you're restoring streams, you're also considering what are the wetland areas around the stream that I need to protect and restore at the same time. But wetlands also do this. They make a lot of biting flies. This is a deer fly. Uh, people don't appreciate these. And I understand why. Deer flies suck. Well, actually, they bite and then they lap. But they do suck. And they do a lot of biting. Wetlands are also important for uh, mosquitoes. They are areas where water remains often for long periods of time in small bodies of water. That's great sort of mosquito habitat. So again, another... Uh, another issue associated with them. There are real, I want to be clear that I want to protect wetlands usually, but I also want you to understand that that's going to come at a cost. If you've ever lived near a wetland, then you will know uh, that there are issues associated with being around a wetland and how do we control that. For instance, I don't want to just restore wetlands everywhere, especially when regions that are struggling with malaria. I want to control malaria, right? And so losing wetlands may actually help me do that. Wetlands also require a lot of room and they do flood. And if you build up right against them, right, then you can lose houses. And this idea of a dynamic and uh, movable stream uh, is one that we are generally not as satisfied with. We would really like the stream to be in its channel and us to be in our channel. Channel here, I'm putting in quotes for the human side. We want the stream to remain where it is it is, and us to be in other places. But we have to remember that these systems are, are highly dynamic and change uh, regularly. 
and that there's nothing we can do about that, although we can change the frequency uh, with which these systems do these sort of large scale events. We just talked a little bit about what is currently in place within the environmental movement and how that might affect us when we think about stream restoration. But let's shift and think a little bit now about what is happening at this very moment and where we're going. And one of the big ones is this, that there's a very strong um, new movement within the environmental movement uh, associated with social awareness, right? And the socially aware consumer. And social awareness has been really important for a lot of different organizations. And you see this over and over again. An early version of this was dolphin safe tuna. Okay, there is in fact tuna that can be caught without doing injury to dolphins and so they can get a dolphin safe label and people seem to like that idea. But today that has expanded enormously, right? If you're on campus, you'll absolutely see LEED certified buildings. That's an organization that, that takes it, uh, a look at the production of a building and says, or the production or, or refurbishment of buildings and saying whether that is uh, low carbon, uh, less uh, environmentally damaging, or even environmentally benefiting if you in fact offset that building uh, versus say a building that you you don't care, you're just gonna build the cheapest building you can, right? And LEED certification is expensive and difficult. Energy Star, if you've ever seen this on appliances, right, is making some claim about the efficiency of that appliance, right? And it's not doing it because you're sitting there thinking, I wanna save eight cents per year on my refrigerator. You're doing it because you're saying, I wanna save the, room, the 800 pounds of carbon dioxide that I might, uh, uh, reduce in the atmosphere. Organic products are exactly taking advantage of this. Eating local uh, is a socially aware consumer issue. This issue of fracking uh, was driven very strongly by social considerations, right? Fracking is a process by which natural gas is removed from the ground and it was uh, expanded or the, the types of fracking that could be done were expanded by the uh, Bush Jr. Uh, and the, the administration. But the uh, response has been very mixed. Uh, in some areas, people are gung-ho about it. In other areas, there's a large scale movement against it. And the socially aware consumer has driven that, right? I don't even wanna buy natural gas that is fracked in this way. Okay, and so that's very different than what we've had before. Something that we want to be aware of as we think about these things uh, and where the environmental movement is now is what is a degraded system? So I would look at a place like this, right? This is a city. And you might say to yourself, is this degraded? And what would that mean, right? I'm pretty sure, in fact, this is Baltimore. Uh, is this a degraded system? Well, I guess it depends on who you talk to, right? If you talk to Thoreau, yeah, that would be super degraded. But in other ways, this system is really, really, really useful and productive. And degraded in what sense? Right? It's been it's been modified and developed, um, and it's very useful for humans. Another picture here, picture on the left and picture on the right, same location. Is the picture on the right a degraded system? Right. Is that degraded? This is a uh, tropical area that was hit by a hurricane. Okay, and so the picture on the right is the response to that. Uh, if it, if you came to me and said that picture on the right is absolutely degraded and we need to restore it, then you are arguing that hurricanes are natural degradators of biological systems or of natural systems and we need to work to undo their effects. But in fact, hurricanes can be really important for the biology of an area. But what if I said that that hurricane is almost certainly caused by climate change, right? So there's a lot of layers uh, associated with this and we have to be thoughtful about what we mean and what we're gonna do and what we anticipate doing. Restoration on the one hand seems easy. I wanna turn this uh, degraded stream into a not degraded stream. What do you mean by degraded? What's caused it? Can we still undo it? Right, so be thoughtful about this when you hear the words restoration thrown around. It's a complex thing. One of the most important things that we have to get 
uh, two is what are the objectives of a of restoration, right? Is it to revegetate? Is it to make the area look pretty? Is it a habitat enhancement? Is it remediation or mitigation, right? Remediation here, replacing another after it's been uh, uh, deteriorated or lost, or mitigation meaning you're required uh, to build another habitat of similar uh, quantity to it. Or is it none of these things, right? And so the objective of the restoration also has to be uh, considered as well. And the fact is that revegetating an area may do nothing more than plant a bunch of really attractive trees. And in a sense, that's just making it pretty for the human eye. It may have none of the ecological function that it did in the first place. The other thing about restoration that people are sometimes confused about is they think that this means, I don't know, that it's going to be like a real simple sort of kumbaya movement. Uh, restoration relies on very many advanced technological tools, not least of which heavy construction equipment. Here is a stream that has clearly been dammed, right, and all the water drained down, and they are inserting woody debris into the banks to help stabilize it with a uh, with with uh, construction equipment and they're certainly cutting and removing woody debris from elsewhere and trucking it in and this approach may work very well for what this restoration project is attempting to do but it's certainly not like uh, carbon neutral right this is going to be a pretty intensive and it's going to require a lot of energy time and manpower and so we need to be thoughtful about is this worth doing? And maybe it is. Maybe this is a really good idea. Uh, but it is a very different world. Look at the stream here. You can see there's a path, a, a paved path right up next to it. They have not, for instance, built out the riparian zone on the left bank there very far. So what they're doing here is they're going to make some sort of more naturally fluctuating riparian zone but they're not recovering what is been there. In fact, it would probably be best to move that path away from the stream and allow that stream to have more natural riparian areas. But again, that's a that comes with all sorts of costs and decision points. Here's an example of a restored element of a stream. People look at this, they say it's really pretty. Look at that, it looks really good. But this is actually restored specifically to provide trout habitat. So. Does it provide trout habitat? Yes, it does. This provides a really nice plunge pool. It's great for trout. It oxygenates the stream, provides easy access upstream so they can easily jump over that if they want to. But you may not want trout. And remember that many of the trout that may be in there are non-native trout, right, or invasive. So when you hear the word restore, be thoughtful about what you're actually attempting to do. Let's think a little bit then about how we might go about restoring a system. Well, how would you restore this car? Right? If you came to me and I said, I want to restore this car, maybe the question I might ask you is, do you want the car to drive? Right? Then we restore it a different way. Do you want it to look really close to how it did when it was first purchased? Well, we might restore it a different way, but maybe I don't have to worry about the engine. Do you are you concerned about just making it unique? Right? You want it to be really good looking but unique. Well, then we could store it a different way. Do you want to instead salvage a piece of it? Right? Maybe we don't want the whole thing. Maybe we want to just to, to say we need to scrap most of the car, but I'd really like to save the door because it's an important memento and I'd like to restore it to the original appearance, right? Or some element, the hubcap or the or the trunk or whatever it is, right? What if you can't restore it exactly as it was, right? So what if the materials that you are relying upon, you can't get access to? So for instance, this car probably used lead paint and was a lead-based engine uh, or, or lead fuel in, uh, injected engine. Probably those things are not available any longer, so you're going to have to use different parts. Is the goal of the restoration to make it an identical one-to-one -one carbon copy of what it was when it was produced, albeit with new parts? Or is it to use parts that you already have in place in the car and try to salvage as much as you can and then decide if you can't salvage it, you're not going to put it in? Or is it to just make it function and look like the original, right? And all these things are very similar to what we might do with restoration projects. Do we want it to function like it did? Do we want to salvage what's in place or do we want to go get other resources? Do we care if we use stuff from outside the system? Do you care if I use non-natives in this restoration project, right? 
they, they're already present in and around the region. They'll get here anyway. Do you want me just to, to hasten that process or will you only accept natives? Uh, are you concerned about uh, the the appearance of it? Does it need to look pretty or can it just function? Right, A lot of things very, very similar to the way that we we'd think about it if we were doing a stream restoration. And in the past, many research, uh, uh, stream restoration or restoration efforts have focused on a single species. So, for instance, a great example of that is being really focused on, I want to make trout habitat for the trout in my stream. And usually it's just one trout. I just want this species of trout to, to do better. And what we've seen more and more and what the, the direction that we're going is that we want to include more species and preferably, wherever possible, think of this holistically as the entire ecosystem. So think of this not just for the trout, but think of this for the other species in it. Think about this for the terrestrial system. Think about this in relation to climate change. And really importantly, think about how humans are part of that system. Think about what humans may want to do recreationally in it. Think about what they may want to do commercially. How can we restore the system to provide as much as we can for all these groups? Or if we're not going to be able to provide for each group to exclude them from one area, but provide opportunities in others, right? So if you're thinking about, well, there's no commercially exploited item from a stream then you have not been in enough streams uh, there are plenty of things that people commercially exploit from streams not least of which fish and maybe one way that we can approach this is instead of trying to do deal with the problem of having to try to balance all those needs people will often do this where they take one species and it's a charismatic species and then they protect it and by protecting it they're able to protect far broader areas. So for instance, Trout Unlimited is very concerned with the development of streams for trout and for fishing access. But by doing that, by being very concerned about those kind of things, they are in effect protecting a lot of other species as long as they can coexist with trout. So trout can act in that sense like an umbrella species. They're protecting other things, even though Trout Unlimited does not have a stated goal. We wanna protect aquatic macrophyte diversity Right. If the trout are protecting stream areas and aquatic macrophyte diversity happens to be protected in that and it may uh, produce more trout as a result of that, that all seems good to Trout Unlimited. Another element that is modern is this idea of adaptive management. OK, and this one you'll see follows this pattern where what you will do now is develop a model that you plan to use, design and implement that model, and then monitor it. And this is really important that you actually go in and say, did it do what we expected to do? In the past, what we've often done is we've said, this is what it should do. We go in and modify the system and then we leave. And clearly that's not a good way to do that. Uh, what we need to be doing is being thoughtful about what is working and what's not working. After we monitor it, we evaluate it, and then we adjust our response. If we don't get the response we want, then we go through and iterate this again. We develop a new model. We design and implement that. Now, adaptive management on the surface is really attractive, uh, especially when we think about restoration. Not only are you going to do it right, but you're going to guarantee you're going to do it right by going back and checking and checking again. And you, maybe you can even adjust it to do exactly what you want it to do. The problem is that that's expensive and it takes a lot of effort and it's a long term issue. If you tell me that you want to monitor a stream for how long? Five years? Is that sufficient? 10 years? 20 years? What is the time horizon you're thinking about? A year? Right? What if in that single year you have a large hurricane come through, a large storm event? Right? That monitoring is going to be relatively useless. All it's going to do is tell you that there is a big storm event that came through and that the system is functioning very differently than you anticipate in most other years. So these types of, of ideas are really, really useful. And we should really be thinking about how we can do adaptive management. And we also need to be thoughtful then about what that means. Where do we get off of the uh, adaptive management uh, sort of uh, roller coaster? The other thing that I mentioned earlier, and if you saw the video on salmon and, and trout, you'll see this as well, is that the goals and targets have to be reachable. Many times uh, people have put pie in the sky ideas out as the goal, we're going to reach this, or they put really high and lofty goals that are so far beyond this scope that it's impossible to reach them in any reasonable time frame. And this is really discouraging, right? Because you are told this is what's going to happen and then you go out and try to do it and you're nowhere near it. 
So you have to be really careful about promising or over promising and under delivering. And so goals and targets and setting reasonable ones and expectations are a really important part of restoration, making sure that people can understand and be thoughtful about what it means to reach a target. So I'm going to provide, again, the link to the salmon if you're interested uh, in seeing it. This shorter segment has some interesting bits about the social aspect of goals and targets and salmon restoration on the West Coast. And just as we get to the end here, I know we're so close. Uh, there's also this thing called a social license. And a social license is the society's commitment to allow that thing to proceed. Many of what we are sort of discussing, thinking about right now, deal with governmental intervention to some degree, either demanding that these things happen, right, and then requiring that they be done, or that uh, they uh, they themselves go in and actually do it. And so the society at large has to be okay with this. And it does matter, right? There's this thing about uh, whether we accept that thing to actually move forward or not. Now, if you are uh, psychologically identify with that group, uh, then you may be, uh, for instance, in the current climate, you can either be for or against something. Apparently, there's nothing in between. But if you, let's say that you're pro protection of a stream section, you psychologically identify with that group. That group attacks on that group come across as personal attacks, right? And that's really dangerous in an environment to think that you are the one being attacked and not the policy, because then it becomes if this person wins part of me dies in that sense. So I've got to fight tooth and nail to protect it. But there is an important element of psychologically identifying with a group. Uh, but we have to be careful about being too gung-ho about that. And when you psychologically identify, you generally are the everything about the group. Yeah, we do this. This is good. We're part of this. We appreciate it. This is a good thing we should be doing. You can also be just giving approval or support. Yeah, that's fine. Um, I'm proud of the collaborative achievement. But if it changes, so be it. Uh, but we we accept that uh, for what it is. Uh, there can be acceptance or what I like to think of as just tolerance where it's allowed, but you don't actively help it. And there is uh, there is a sense of distrust. OK. And then finally, there can be a social license, which is withheld or withdrawn. And that's where you see responses to that, like blockades and boycotts. People do not want this, and they will work very hard to prevent it. An example of that would be the Keystone XL pipeline. Indeed, there are people that psychologically identify with it and promote it. But there's clearly a bit of the social license, which has been, I would say, withdrawn uh, for at least some of the groups that are involved with that process. These also have uh, boundary layers. Um, there's a trust layer, there's a credibility layer. So as you fall below the support layer, you move be below credibility. You no longer believe uh, that the organization is uh, a credible organization. We're really in a place right now in the US government where we are, uh, different groups are dealing with this credibility boundary issue. There is a large group that is strongly opposed to many features because they don't believe anything that's coming out of the, the federal government. Right. And it goes both ways for both parties. Both parties have a credibility boundary related to the other party's side. And then finally, at a legitimacy boundary, you begin to question whether the government should exist or not. Right. Or that organization should even exist or not, because it appears to be a bad thing. So be thoughtful about that when you go into restoration. If you go in and you just try to uh, sort of push everyone aside and do your own view of the world, you'll very quickly move from a, from a trusting environment to a legitimacy problem. People will no longer think that you should be in there. And once you lose your social license, it can be very difficult to recover. And if you're doing restoration, that can mean people can actively sabotage uh, your work by doing things like digging things up or throwing things in or uh, or breaking uh, materials. So for instance, if you plant trees, people may come down and actually break the trees down, right? Uh, so it's really important that restoration be thought of in this more holistic sense where we think about, well, the society and the community that we're doing the restoration in has to come with us. We can't just impose our view of restoration on somebody else. And this is a good example. So take a look at what happened to the stream. So in 1960, you can see this land is undeveloped. And by the 2010s, of course, there's tons of houses all over it. But that by the early 2000s, you can see that those houses were already in place. 
But in the early 2000s, clearly a decision was made to begin to think about restoration, right? So by 2001, there's some construction going on. 2005, they're attempting to restore wetlands. By 2010, they have an established riparian zone. But they're doing this in a very narrow constraint, right? They have that boxed area. This is where you're allowed to work, nowhere else, right? And so you have to make that area work really well. And if you go to there, I'm sure that you would see that and say, that looks like a natural stream. But of course, now you've seen the pictures, you know it is not and you know that it doesn't look exactly like it did when it was there in the first place of course it never really looked like that for very long right but my point being that you have to be thoughtful about what's available to you and then think about what can i do that will be productive and useful what does the community want right so restoration is not about blowing people off the landscape in a sense like whew, get out of here uh, it is a it's a way in which we're modifying the environment we live in to provide us more of that functional world, either for beauty or just because we want it to exist, that we've removed in the first place. All right, and that is the end of this lecture. So Grumpy Cat says, good, it's over. I do want to mention one more thing before you leave, that being that your final presentations will be due after the class is done. I expect your final presentations to be short, uh, but they should be in a format similar to what you saw here in these lecture series.